Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation, my funding sources for their support, and all my collaborators who worked in these results, the ones that I will share with you today. Rob asked me to, to give a general talk to motivate discussions, and let's see how I can fare in that task. Okay. Uh, my name is Raul Tempone, and uh, it's a pleasure being here today. So here's the plan of my talk. I will briefly recall Monte Carlo and Martina Monte Carlo, and then I will go through the, contribute, uh, the contributions that my group has produced over the years in these uh, problems, not only in forward computations with multi-level, but also in inverse problems. All right. So as a motivational example, so to keep you in, so with something in mind, um, let's consider a random PDE where the coefficient A here and F are uh, random and therefore the solution U is also random as well. And uh, the goal of our computation is to compute this real value, which is expected value of a functional evaluated on the solution U, okay? We, uh, we will approximate u by uh, some kind of approximate method, finite element, finite difference, or whatever. And this will be indexed by a parameter h, the evaluation of the function along such approximate solution u bar h will yield g sub h. And this will be also real valued random variable. And instead of computing with g, we will compute with g sub h. The tacit assumption here, obviously, is that we have consistency, namely when h goes to zero, say, uh, g sub h converges to g, and also the cost, for example, to evaluate g sub h goes to infinity as h goes to zero. To analyze Monte Carlo, which is the basic method we are going to, to start with, we need to see that we are approximating an expected value of g by a sample average of the wrong quantity, namely g sub h. Okay, we use m samples to uh, approximate that expectation, and they are identically distributed according to g sub h and independent. When we want to understand the resulting error, we see that we have two crimes here. One, that is the approximation of the expectation by this incorrect expectation, and then further, an approximation of this expectation by sample average. Therefore, it is natural to split the total error into a bias and statistical error contribution. The bias is completely governed by the parameter h, whereas the statistical error that has mean value zero is essentially governed by the number of samples m according to the central limit theorem. All right, so the further step here is to recognize that our goal is to minimize the computational work, which is the number of samples times the work per sample, here exploding as h goes to zero, as I told you before, with a certain rate that uh, relates to the sparsity of the matrix that we have to solve, essentially, for that linear elliptic equation. And now the total error has to be kept within a prescribed accuracy in probability, of course, that is given by toll. If you solve this, Simple problem, you get this further result, which is that the work essentially is tall to the minus two times tall to the minus d gamma divided by w. The first term in this product is corresponding to the number of samples needed to control the statistical error below tall, whereas the second one is related to the size of h that makes the bias error less than tall. Okay? And then you could say this could be the end of it. If I just use this sampling method, which is Monte Carlo, and I use my finite elements, for instance, to evaluate an approximate realization, that's it. Now the question arises, and this is what motivated, motivates the rest of the talk, can we do something better without changing the discretization method, but just sampling in a slightly different way? And the answer is yes, according to the multi-level method, essentially, based on the seminal works of Giles and Heinrich, we can use a hierarchy of discretizations indexed by L, which will be denoted in this talk as a level of the computation, where each level corresponds to a different discretization parameter, 
H sub L, that is just a subdivision of the original parameter in the courses level, if you wish, by say beta here to the minus L, you can think of beta being two, right? So that you can define these differences, differences between numerical discretizations of G and uh, we can write in a telescopic way the approximation of G on the level L capital that we note in this way, right? As a sum of these differences. And the main step in multi-level Monte Carlo is to use Monte Carlo for each of these expectations instead of using it for this expectation. The main goal here is of course to exploit the, the fact that uh, coarser levels have less work per sample than the deeper levels. And furthermore, these differences are converging in some suitable way to zero, right? Because there is consistency, namely as L goes to infinity, G sub L converges to G and the difference therefore should go to zero, right? We need to exploit that and we will exploit it in two different ways. One is to, to see that this difference in the mean is going to zero, but also is going in L2. Essentially the variance of that difference is also going to zero, okay? So the, and the, the estimator of material Monte Carlo looks like this, sum over the levels and then averages of differences throughout levels. I think the whole point here is to try to sample less in, uh, in measures that are fine and more in measures that are coarse, right? We have uh, the, the variance in Monte Carlo look like a single term like this, right? And we wanted to make it less than tall square. Now in the, in the new method, I mean the multi-level method, we have a sum of certain things now that will be differences. And the first term actually only resembles this one where this G sub zero being something that is much cheaper to, to sample that than the G sub L, okay? Um, so if one wants to get uh, some theoretical results of multi-level Monte Carlo, we need to some, uh, uh, make some assumptions, right? One, as I told you, is the convergence in the mean, which is related to the bias error, that we have a certain rate here, W, the rate of the strong error, variance. In this case, we have an, a, a rate that is S, and the work will be low enough according to this D gamma, as I motivated before, right? All these constants are positive here, and uh, that, is a, that is a simple thing to follow. Now, um, if you now write the total work of multilayer Monte Carlo, you recognize that the work will be related to the cost of sampling one of these differences in level L times the corresponding number of samples that we use in such level, M sub L. And if we now choose fixing the L capital, if we choose the M sub Ls optimally to minimize the computational work subject to having the statistical error less than tall square, I mean, less than tall, say, then we get this result. This result, essentially, the work is just tall to the minus two times the sum of terms, essentially, that are fixed now, and the only variable that is left here is in capital. Because of the fact that uh, we need the bias error to go to zero as, uh, as uh, we decrease the tolerance, we need, essentially, the L capital to go to infinity with some rate. In this case, it will be um, logarithmically, right? With respect to toll. Because of that, when uh, toll goes to zero, this will go to infinity and we have a sum here that becomes a series. And the series, depending on how this work blows up and this variance goes to zero, we have two possible situations. One, it will blow up as toll goes to zero or it will remain bounded, right? And if it remains bounded, we will only have tall to the minus two here times O1. And that work is actually the work that corresponds to uh, a method that essentially behaves like an exact pathway solution. Essentially for each omega, I'm able to get uh, the exact approximation without bias and corresponding to a cost of evaluation that is O1, which essentially may, may sound shocking the first time you, you see it, but it's not like, uh, like that, as we will see in the next slide.
Indeed, once we choose the number of levels to control the bias error, we can put everything together and have this, uh, this theorem that I'm citing here um, that essentially says that there are three regimes. One is where the bias actually, uh, sorry, one is where the um, variance error is converging faster than the way the, the work is blowing up. And in that case, as I told you, you get told to the minus two as a complexity, which is fantastic. And in, worst, in the worst case, you still get some advantage with respect to Monte Carlo because you have, you have here d gamma minus s instead of just d gamma. So this is still better. But today's questions actually, among others, will uh, take us to adaptivity. We'll say, okay, how can we extend multi-level Monte Carlo computations into non-uniform adaptive discretization settings? And is it worth it? So for that, I'm going to first concentrate on uh, stochastic differential equations of ETO type. And uh, I just briefly recall what we did in the past, right? I mean, first we work in single level approximations, and then we moved on to multi-level with different uh, flavors. Essentially, first we tried to create a, a multi-level adaptive uh, methods that were controlling the error in the weak sense, essentially controlling the way the way the mean value converges, the mean value of the difference converges. But lately we realized that actually what made much sense or better sense was to control the um, strong error of the difference. And then we came up with a slightly different uh, result that I will explain now. So first I need to be very brief briefly take you into stochastic dynamics. In this case, we have a ETO stochastic differential equation that is written in terms of a drift function and a set of diffusion functions. Here, Ws are independent linear processes. And again, we want to compute a real value, in this case, the expected value of a given function G evaluated at the final state of the solution of this stochastic differential equation. Applications, well, they're everywhere diffusion processes, Langevin dynamics, computational finance, crowd flows, you name it. Okay, so, but in this case, uh, the contribution that I'm highlighting is the first adaptive multi-level Monte Carlo algorithm and its mathematical analysis, not just the mathematical analysis of, of the, the way the discretizations are converging, but the whole algorithm with the stopping and, uh, and refinement rules. What is the battle horse in this, uh, in this game? Well, essentially the simplest method you can use to approximate the paths of this uh, stochastic differential equation is the so-called four-order scheme that is in this context called Euler-Maruyama. And you see here the same structure as you, you have in, in, in Euler, but the delta Ws here are just, have, are just independent uh, um, normal distributed random variables with mean zero and variance delta tn. Okay, that are very simple to generate. So thanks to this, going uh, through this uh, recursion, we find an approximation of x at final time and then we evaluate it. Now, what's the game in adaptivity? Well, in uh, adaptivity, essentially we want to, given a tolerance, find um, times for refinements that are non-uniform and possibly stochastic to create realizations of X bar T capital that correspond to minimal work and still satisfy the accuracy constraints. Why do we want to do that? Well, we may have non-smoothness in either coefficient A or B that can decrease the convergence rate. So we need to actually address this by picking carefully our time steps. And uh, everything is based on theory, mathematical theory where first we derived a weak error density in a series of works that essentially says that you can approximate up to um, computable leading order terms, the difference between the expected value of G at evalu evaluated at the exact uh, path minus G evaluated at the approximate path as essentially an integral from zero to T of the expected value of the time step that is being used. And this is kept inside of the expectation because it may be stochastic times an error density, what we call the error density, that is evaluated at the approximate process, x bar. Okay, so essentially this can be made computable. And uh, when rho essentially is large, delta t has to be small and so forth, right? But again, everything is chosen so to minimize the work while satisfying the, 
the accuracy constraints. If you want to actually proceed, fa proceed further in the multi-level Monte Carlo game, you would like to introduce a stro stronger density. And do, this took uh, some more years to produce. It was done in 2014. Um, and essentially there, we represented, I mean, we approximated the leading order term of the different, the square of the, of the different uh, expected value sets, which is the quantity that essentially governs the, the variance that we need to compute in the multi-level uh, differences. And this again can be linked to uh, an error density, but it's not the same as the previous one. This is why we call it density strong instead of density weak in the other case. Okay. Um, to produce algorithms based on these on this, uh, densities, we compute out of these densities some error indicators. And these error indicators will tell us essentially when to stop if the maximum error indicator is below a certain quantity. And if we do not stop, we can use again the error indicators to decide which intervals need to be refined with precise rules. Right? And for those intervals that we need to refine, we will use Brownian bridges, right? which is the right way to do uh, stochastic interpolation in this setting. So, so far so good. And everything was based on um, single level methods. But how do we apply? How do we come up with a multi-level Monte Carlo based on an up time stepping? Well, the way we did it was to let the tolerance be the running, uh, the, I mean, the governing parameter. Essentially, a hierarchy will be defined by the combination of choosing different tolerances for different levels and running essentially the single level adaptive algorithm to reach that accuracy on each of these levels. And it, it will be done in such a way that we keep the correlation between the consecutive levels but to make the, the convergence rate of the, of the variance going to zero appropriately. When is adaptivity useful for Matilde Monte Carlo? Well, Again, as I told you, A and B may not be smooth, right? And you may have certain things like stop diffusions, reflected diffusions even, and uh, such things. In that case, in those cases, actually there's a benefit from using adaptivity. Now, our results on multi-level Monte Carlo with adaptivity. In this context, essentially we provided the theoretical analysis of this adaptive uh, multi-level Monte Carlo algorithm, proving uh, that the algorithm always stops, that we have asymptotic normality based on the Lindeberg failures uh, central, limit theorem, uh, central limit theorem, that's right. And uh, then that we have asymptotic accuracy, namely that we can uh, achieve with a prescribed confidence the error being bounded by toll. And the complexity essentially that we say that uh, one can show that the, the complexity essentially becomes the, the, the natural complexity with uniform steps for smooth problems when you don't have smoothness there, all right? And uh, technical things that are game stoppers usually are the fact that the approximations that we make on X bar are non adapted to the natural filtration, namely they depend on the future because we used uh, uh, weighted, uh, dual weighted uh, residual uh, estimators and they, they need variations that depend on the on the future. So one has to be careful to actually do some kind of Malleavian expansion and show that everything is working, which is done actually and everything's fine, but, but it's technical. Now, how does it fare in, uh, in numerical examples? Well, here's an example with a singularity, right? At a given time, alpha, the alpha may be stochastic or maybe deterministic, it doesn't matter. The adaptive algorithm doesn't know where the alpha is, so it has to refine accordingly. And we just index everything on this P, which is the strength of the singularity. Essentially, when P is larger, the singularity is stronger. And you expect that you need to refine more carefully around the singularity to control it, right? Now, what we see here are results corresponding to a uniform multi level Monte Carlo with uh, essentially um, constant time steps and the adaptive multi level Monte Carlo that refines according to the rules that I told you before. And in this case, based on the strong error density, you see that when P is uh, essentially one half, there's not much difference between the adaptive and the uniform, but as P increases, we see that actually the rate and the constant 
are so much better uh, from uh, for for the adaptive method, right? So we are not talking just about rates. We are talking about rates and constants, and the 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 difference is actually quite marked. So now we move on to something different, slightly different from adaptivity. We are going to exploit uh, or to uncover regularity to be able to deal with difficult problems, essentially in the context of option pricing and, uh, and PDF evaluation, probability density function, I mean. So what's the point? Well, again, we are in the same context. We have a stochastic differential equation. We want to evaluate this quantity that may represent the value of a contract, for instance. G is given and X has to be approximated. What's the problem? The problem is that G is rough. Maybe this continuous or even a distribution, a delta, Dirac delta distribution. What is the technique, the idea that we used? Essentially, we use the tower property. Essentially, we write this expectation as the expectation of a conditional expectation where we choose this B, the quantity we are conditioning on carefully so that when we compute this becomes the expected value of f of b and now f of b has higher regularity is much better behaved than the original than the original g okay so this is it's just a, a known uh, known uh, trick in um, Monte Carlo computations right to produce uh, conditional expectations to reduce variance but in this context we not only do it to reduce variance, but also to gain regularity and be able to apply methods that one would not even think of using for the original problem here because of the roughness of the given function g. Okay, so we do essentially numerical smoothing to uncover the available regularity, and this means some root finding to determine essentially this continuity, the the ability to to compute this uh, this inside expectation in a in a clever way to, to keep the rates of convergence in the right, uh, in the right level, right? And uh, then once we do that, the resulting integrand is much better behaved and we are able to use, for instance, um, adaptive uh, uh, sparse grid uh, quadrature or quasi Monte Carlo or something like that, that in principle, we would not have been able to use, all right? So there are a bunch of tricks here. We need to use Brannion bridges, as I told you before, to reduce effective dimension and the uh, richest extrapolation to increase the, the weak error to, um, to have a smaller dimension uh, in the quadrature to face essentially, All right? But uh, even the multi-level Monte Carlo will gain in this game because essentially, as you will see, if we have, for instance, a, a, a PDF to compute, G is a, is a delta and therefore the variance is infinity. So we have already a problem with Monte Carlo. Um, and, but even if it is discontinuous, we also have a deterioration on the strong rate of multi-level Monte Carlo, and that is also improved with these kind of methods without, in, 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 without adding essentially new errors. So this is really a, a big step in the computations. Okay, so um, for density estimation, as I told you, the, the thing is even more brutal because you have a delta here and uh, the variance is infinity. So we do this, uh, these computations to, to actually achieve something that you can deal with in the Monte, in, in the, yeah, in the Monte Carlo multi-level context, all right? And this does not, I mean, the, the, the method that we are advertising here does not deteriorate with respect to the length of the vector X here, okay? And this is particularly important when you do, um, PDF estimation, you know well from kernel density estimation that you have a cursor dimensionality when you actually smooth out uh, because of the fact that actually the, the variance of this underlying is infinity. We don't have this in this, issue, in, in, in this, tip, in this type of methods. Uh, the variance of this underlying now is all one and everything's well behaved. So this behaves way much better with respect to the, the dimension. So, um, just a couple of, uh, of results here. Um, you see here, we have computed with a bunch of uh, cases, uh, the geometric random motion and Hestian as well. Um, and in all of them, we, we saw a dramatic uh, advantage when using uh, um, these kind of methods based on the smoothing. 
for in this case for uh, sparse grids versus Monte Carlo, right? So the 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 CPU time gain here is uh, is brutal when you make this quotient, and you can see also or well, less what you expect in the in the computations with multi-layer Monte Carlo, where you see a dramatic improvement from no smoothing to smoothing in the kurtosis, for instance, and the strong rate here in moving from one half to one, which makes the, the computation in complexity better than before, right? But I mean, this, this kurtosis issue is not a small issue indeed, uh, because you need to control the, the kurtosis to have a better control on the, on the estimation of the needed number of realizations per level. Right, because the variance of the variance is essentially the kurtosis, so you need to to estimate correctly the variances that yield the number of uh, realizations that you need to do correctly, and this is particularly important in the deeper levels. And in the deeper levels, this is where the kurtosis actually blows up in the worst possible way. So this method has this this extra uh, extra advantage, right? Not only converges better, but also the the quantities you need to to estimate in Matilde Monte Carlo are better behaved to guide your, your, uh, your computations. All right. Now I changed slightly the setup. We are still in uh, uncovering smoothness, but in this case, I make it a little bit more difficult. Is the rough, we go into rough volatility. We leave essentially the, the stochastic differential equations that we were discussing before. Now we go into, into paths that, well, the practitioners in finance say that uh, depict better what you see in the markets, but they have uh, some nasty properties. Namely, the paths will be non-Markovian and the Hölder regularity will be lower than in the usual um, diffusions. Essentially, instead of being almost one half, they will be uh, much lower. Okay? So here I include the, um, the main reference, in, uh, in reference from the modeling point of view. And uh, this is the description of the rough Nagomi. Essentially, it's a rough volatility uh, model where you have here the evolution of the asset, right? And here, this new is what introduces all, introduces all this nastiness through a uh, uh, riemann lubil process that's indexed in the parameter H. And H, again, controls the or governs the regularity that is, uh, that is uh, commonplace in this uh, system. Okay, um, so which are the challenges? Numerically, um, the, the problem, again, as I told you, this model is non-Markovian and is non-affine, so the standard numerical methods, at least the efficient ones that you want to think of, PD solving and, and so forth, are not available. Monte Carlo, as you know, is, is expensive, and unfortunately, multi level Monte Carlo is not there to help you. Why? Because this H parameter, the H parameter that was governing the regularity of the paths of the volatility, uh, is controlling also the strong convergence rate. And the strong convergence rate will be of order H. And if H, for example, has to be 0 0.02 or 0 0.07, well, multi level Monte Carlo will not be such an attractive uh, method anymore. And this actually happens. So this is tough from the numerical perspective. From the theoretical perspective, there is no proper weak analysis done in the rough volatility context, again, because this is a tough problem. There's no Markovianity, so we have infinite dimensional setups. And we have the singularity in these kernels, K sub H, that I was discussing before. All right, so this is a tough thing. There are ongoing works. Hopefully, they will be finished within uh, 15 days, a result that but actually that's an error, not only an error um, estimate, but an error expansion on this weak error, but okay, so far it's not out in the literature. So what do we do? Well, again, we go through analytic smoothing, right, to uncover uh, available regularity. In this case, we don't need to solve something numerical, we can do it uh, in an analytic way. And then after that, we are able to use, again, uh, sparse grids or quasi Monte Carlo, obtaining uh, dramatic improvements in the in the numerics, right? Again, if we see, we tried here with a bunch of uh, parameters that are realistic and with Hurst indexes that are really low, as you see here. With Hurst index in in, uh, 
in diffusions will be 0 0.5, right? But in this case, we have 0 0.02, 0 0.07. So you can imagine it's almost a distribution of the path. Um, but still, after doing these smoothing tricks, one is able to have a, a tremendous advantage from uh, sparse grids versus Monte Carlo and from quasi Monte Carlo versus Monte Carlo. And you can see this in these plots again, that you have a relative error, right? So you're trying to achieve and the growth of the work and you see that the lower this, this curve, the better is the method. In this case, the winners are uh, quasi Monte Carlo and sparse grids with, uh, combined with, the, with just an extrapolation. So now we switch the topic. This is noise driven by Poisson random measures namely continuous time Markov chains, or also uh, stochastic reaction networks, right? Paths here are discrete in space, piecewise constant, but they are not boring at all, as you would see. Um, these are very much used in the biochemistry, for instance, uh, epidemics and so forth. So you, you track um, through reactions, essentially certain components, and you try to compute the expected values of these in different ways. This is just one motivational example. Uh, mathematically, this is um, the dynamics are determined by reaction channels. And uh, we have sto stoichiometric vectors here that tell you what happens when this reaction uh, fires. And these reactions occur in time randomly, but according to a certain regulation that uh, connects to propensity functions that are state dependent and act in the following way. Again, the computation here that we want to do is the expected value of G of XT capital. And uh, this is even used in stochastic uh, epidemic spread modeling. Uh, we have plenty of work here in the multi-level realm. I'm not going to list them all, but I'm going to tell you a little bit which are the motivations that are taking us into these uh, numerics. Essentially, exact algorithms exist. So you could actually uh, sample these, these, these paths without any discretization error, bias error, but the counterpart is that uh, these algorithms may be too expensive since we have to track every single event that happens in the system. We have approximate algorithms, say tau leap, which is essentially a forward order method, which may be faster, but they introduce bias and may lead to negative populations. Our contribution in this, in this uh, field is essentially to come up with a hybrid material Monte Carlo set of techniques to minimize the work and uh, control the, work, the, the error, of course, achieving uh, complexity that is told to the minus two, which is optimal in this context of uh, Monte Carlo. Plenty of examples, as you may realize, uh, gains are substantial from factor 100 to 10 to the four in this example that we are discussing here. Um, the rates between the, the methods uh, of multi-level and the, the exact methods they get constant, right? They are both of, of total to the minus two, but the constants may be dramatic, right? And you get this uh, high speed up. You, we also have tricks to reduce the, the, the variance on level zero, the course is possible level. And we briefly mention now two works farther into this direction. One, which is this, uh, has to do with the use of methods of address stiffness, essentially using the combination of different levels of uh, explicit integrators and in, implicit explicit. I, uh, I leave you with that here. There are examples. We have substantial gains. In this example, we have 50 times uh, of a factor of decrease. And another idea that we have came up recently with is to use important sampling to avoid what is called catastrophic coupling, which is the effect that in, uh, in these discrete systems, when you converge, actually, the actual uh, difference between different uh, uh, levels is actually zero most of the time and only very seldom it takes a value that is all one, right? So this is a nasty uh, kurtosis that has to be addressed and the novel pathwise dependent important sampling did that improving the, com the, com the kurtosis and also improved the convergence rate of the strong error yielding a, a better um, complexity. This was confirmed uh, um, in different examples, I just included one for you to check. I don't have the time to go through, but you can see that the kurtosis system decreases dramatically and uh, we have an improvement on the convergence rate. We also work in optimal hierarchies and continuation multi-level Monte Carlo. Uh, essentially here, the main goal was to 
to come up with a practical algorithm that will learn the parameters for optimal computations on the fly, that is continuation multilevel. And also we discussed the, the way we construct different hierarchies that may not be geometrically spread. A brief comment on multi-index Monte Carlo. Can we improve multilevel uh, Monte Carlo when more regularity is available? The answer is yes uh, for SEEs, PDEs, stochastic particle systems, etc. We developed multi-index Monte Carlo and analyzed these convergence rates through this, uh, this works that I list here and uh, provided optimal sets for approximation. Currently, we're working on extending PD solvers to general geometries via, for example, isogeometric analysis and other techniques. Now, um, if you go beyond and go into inverse polins, I'm running out of time. Um, let's see. Um, we could say that uh, the goal here in, in, uh, in this context is to try to achieve the same type of uh, gain in complexity as Monte Carlo has, but now working with inverse polins that no longer the assumption of independence holds, and you also try to do optimal experimental design, regression, etc. For each of these cases, it is relevant to construct appropriate couplings between levels and to identify key quantities to telescope at a multi-level. Right? For example, in a Samo Kaman filter, the state conditional mean and the, co the co conditional covariance are key quantities to, to telescope. Um, in particle filter, for example, you also have to, to pay attention to important sampling and uh, there also deal with some couplings. In, the, in our case, we, we did the, the Wasserstein type of coupling to improve a little bit the convergence. Um, in multi-level regression, the key here is to uh, split the function that you want to approximate into pieces and then learn those details, try to do regression on those, those, those details to, to gain again in the complexity can also do the approximate Bayesian com computation in this multi-level context, sequential Monte Carlo, even important, uh, even important sampling in the multi-level context for optimal experimental design. Here we have to design the data acquisition procedure before the data is collected. And mathematically, the key quantity in our approach is expected information gain, which is itself a nested expectation to compute. And, uh, our numerical results show dramatic improvement combining hierarchical approaches with important sampling based on some kind of Laplace approximation, right? So uh, we also have touched uh, many applications, at least two here. And uh, I leave you with some words that are not yet in the material context, but uh, we will be pushing towards uh, that in the next coming months, all right? Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, this is the end of my talk.